Hey gorgeous, this is episode number 193 and we have the wonderful Matt Marku back on the show. Hi, this is Matt Marku. You're listening to Heart Cells Podcast with Christine Schlonsky. Enjoy. I can't wait to dive into the topic of financial planning with Matt. He is a certified financial planner and the co-founder of Kendra Path Financial, a fee-based financial planning firm in Orlando, Florida. He covers with his knowledge the four core areas of financial planning, which is retirement planning, tax planning, estate planning, and investment planning. And he has been doing that for over 18 years with his clients. In case he's not working because he loves and enjoys the book, The 4-Hour Workweek, like I do, Math enjoys spending time boating with his beautiful family. So today we're going to go in deeper to the topic why financial planning is so important and what you actually need to do once you are starting to make money with your business or you are getting to that next level because you are scaling up. So have fun and enjoy this episode. Well, I'm so excited to have you back on the show, Matt. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I loved our first interview about outsourcing. And since you are a financial planner, I would love to dive in even deeper of what can people do once they start making money, right? So that they can really create the lifestyle, the wealth that they want to create so that they can do whatever they want to do while running an amazing, successful business. And, you know, you got that real, you got that passion for the finances. And I'm quite sure that doesn't come from, you know, some random something. So I would be really curious to know what was the very first thing you ever sold in your life? Okay. So what, what order should I go in? Should I go there first? Yeah. Like what, okay. like, like the very first thing, like, right. And maybe as a kid, as a teenager, uh, like what, what, what can you remember? I, I can't remember that far back, but I can remember what was most impactful for me. And when I was in college at the university of central Florida, I worked for their call center and my job was to sell um, pledges to get into for money to get to the university of central Florida. So I had to explain to someone why they should take their hard earned money and give it back to their alma mater. Most of the time I was doing this at 7 p.m. in the middle of dinner, um, and it was not the easiest thing to sell at that point in time. But that was what really gave me a passion for knowing something really well, having a passion for that. I was very passionate about my school, and then interrupting someone's dinner to tell them why they should give money uh, to, to the oh, first wow. floor. So that's the first thing I can remember selling, and that was really what launched my career, not because I was selling something, but the people who I met during that uh, particular job is what launched me into where I'm at today. So that was a very impactful selling job that I had. Uh, and that's really what got me where I'm at today. And a lot of it was phone work. And so again, um, a lot of my job is on the phone. So it gave me the, the presence, um, really good phone presence of a 20 year old talking to someone much older than me um, about finances. And that's really what kind of uh, launched me into where I'm at today. Cool, cool. Yeah. And do you remember then the first thing you ever got money for, like the feeling of receiving money for something that you you created, right? Maybe not a job because that's like that's some that's a given. You come in, you have a system, you follow it, you get money. Yeah. But something like that maybe gave you the idea of entrepreneurship, how it feels receiving money. Yeah, I I, I don't know if I can put my finger on that, but I, I knew very early on. I wanted to have my time was most important to me. And so I knew very early on that no matter what I did is I wanted to make sure that I could control what it is that I was doing with my life and I wasn't doing it for somebody else. And so that for, I think for me was my main driver of being an entrepreneur was not necessarily money driven, but it was time driven. Um, I argue now that I'd probably be the world's worst employee. I'm not used to, uh, <laughs> you know, office hours or vacation time or benefits for that matter, both good and bad. Um, but I, I know that um, my time is most important and that's what uh, really kind of drives me to this day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also feel that, you know, time is, we, we don't know how, how long we have. Right. And, you mm. know, we probably both seen, you know, some dramatic stories around having time on this planet. So yeah. my, my thing is always like, stop just dreaming, act now. Because yeah. if you can get it done today, right? If you can fulfill your dream or at least go one step closer <clears throat> to making your dreams come true, then you've spent your time in a pretty wise way 
where you will not have any regrets once yeah. that moment comes, hopefully later than sooner. Yes. But um, also like be, being really mindful of how you conduct your business, how you handle your finances so that you can kind of feel safe because that's what so many people say. Well, I have a job. I feel safe. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to get this income. So after you are an entrepreneur and you have amazing products and services that people want and need and you start selling them because sales is such an important piece mm -hmm. to have a business and not a hobby, you make some revenue. So are there any or is there any advice around that, how people can handle their finances better, especially, you know, at the beginning when they, they're not at the six figures yet or the seven or eight figures or whatever, like what can they do to feel like more safe in the environmental surroundings of entrepreneurship where it goes up and down? That's a great question. And I struggled with that my first year, um, you know, is, is going on being a 1099 employee, you know, or, or being self-employed at that matter. The first thing I had to budget for was, was paying the IRS. Cause as we all very well know, they get their money first and getting that bill on April 14th for me was the biggest eye opener, especially uh, being in the United States or where a self-employed individual pays not only federal income tax, but both sides of FICA tax, the social security and Medicare tax. And I find now that I've been in the business for 17 years, the startup folks um, and, and those that are making, starting to have profit, forget oftentimes that there's a bill we've got to pay before we pay any other bills, and that's the tax man. So I think this all goes back um, to the two main core competencies of financial planning. The first is organization, having a very good metric for knowing what you have, where it's going, um, and make sure that you know exactly. And that's really where the QuickBooks come in. I, I mentioned outsourcing in our previous, um, our previous call, but this is one of the areas that we actually outsource a bookkeeper for us to actually manage our cash flow because even though we are in this business of finance, um, we oftentimes are so busy working on other people's, we don't have the time to work on our own. And so, you know, that, that uh, for us was a really important element. The second uh, behind organization is budgeting. You've got to know on day one what's going out the door and what's coming in the door and being able to put money in the various buckets. And so for us in our business, we have a savings account like we do on my personal side. Um, we have a uh, annual, um, uh, an account that we put annual expenses into that are paid off one time a year. That way that large one-time bill that we get every December, we're not struggling with. We've escrowed for it all year long. Um, and then making sure um, again, from that budgeting standpoint, anything left over, we have a um, an account that we have a uh, like a uh, fail safe. So 10% of anything we make, we put into this account. That way, we know during those rough years or those rough months, we have a, a, a very good savings account to be able to go into. And then from there, we're able to budget out the rest of our items. And so again, I think with organization and budgeting, those are the two main areas. I'm not worried about a retirement plan at this point. I'm not worried about uh, any of those other things, those will come with time, but you got to first know where it is, and then most importantly, where is it going? And once you've answered those two questions, you're ahead of the game because you now can pay the bills on time, you can pay the tax man, and you know at the end of the day what you have left over to pay your own personal lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I think clarity around that is so important. Because, you know, when, when the money comes in, you need to put something aside to, you know, maybe some surprise bills that come up or maybe the tax bill is higher than you thought or you didn't, you know, account for something and or you need a new software and then all of a sudden you have another monthly payment of $100 or 200 or whatever it is or you finally start outsourcing <laughs> when you then need some money for a virtual assistant. So if you start now putting money aside then taking the next step is easier because you already know you are a couple months ahead of the game so you don't get stressed in the process yeah exactly and i have seen it where so many entrepreneurs come to me and this is really where our specialty is is as serving as that outsource partner to to make sure their finances are organized a budget is created and they're sticking to it and then figuring out where the money goes after that. So this is an area that we, we really specialize in, but um, I've seen it so often where a, a new, you know, again, someone who might be coming from the corporate world, 
not used to having to do all of this budgeting on their own, um, really struggle with it that first year. And again, I, I keep hitting back on the tax bill because that's the one non-negotiable that needs to get paid. So I always find that waiting until April 14th to figure out what has been due this last year is not a good way to run a business. You must be escrowing. You must be uh, putting together an organized approach so that you know that bill of all else are going to get paid. Anything else, we can figure out ways of floating or taking income from one month or another, but that's the one that needs to get paid, and that's the one that I've seen the most stress come from because there was no intentionality in place. You must be intentional about your budgeting and your organization. And again, those are the two core competencies or, or two main things that I would tell any new entrepreneur to focus on. Know where your money is going. Yeah. And that, you know, that makes life easier. So what, what would you say, just maybe like a rough estimate, what can or what should be people putting aside from a percentage of what comes in so they don't get into trouble at a later point? Yeah. So I have two savings, oh, three savings accounts um, as part of my business. So Candor Path Financial has our core checking account, and then we have actually three different savings accounts. And they have three distinct purposes. One is to escrow for the taxes. So making sure that we know a pro forma return, how much is going to be due, paying them quarterly, and then whatever the balance will be at the at come, come filing time, March or, or April, depending on what type of business you've created. Um, so that's the first account that we have set up. The second is that 10%, any income we have, 10% of it, we make sure we throw into this bucket. And that way that serves as our emergency savings. The crud really starts to hit the fan. We know that we can dip into that and do pretty much anything we need to in Flotus for a couple of months. The other bucket of money we have, as I mentioned, is those large annual expenses. We have a number of licensing and fees, and those just come up once or twice a year. And so for us to be able to escrow monthly, for those expenses and when they hit we can just slide that money over from our savings account to our checking pay that large expense and not feel that large financial burden and so again if someone's listening to this kind of think about it that way most banks these days you can have as many savings accounts as you want so really creating this bucket system of making sure that when a dollar comes in we know how much needs to go into each one of those three buckets so that we have very few surprises when it comes to our budget yeah. So there, there's a saying that goes, well, pay yourself first. What does it mean for you? Paying myself first means after those three buckets are filled up and the expenses, I, actually, we pay ourselves last. Let's be honest. I mean, the business always comes <laughs> I was first. just going to say, well, that's the other order. That's what I know. So many yeah. people do. But and it took, have, me, it took me so long to understand the system. And, you know, I'm, you know, sometimes I'm good at it. Sometimes I totally suck. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, what, what, tell us a little bit about from the, you know, with a look, uh, the feel of somebody who knows about finances. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think with pay yourself first is really meant to, to think about before you scale your business up, make sure that you have enough to live off of and that this is sustainable. So I think that's probably more where that, that phrase comes into play is once, again, before you start adding new employees, uh, maybe making those large purchases, make sure you've established for yourself a fair and reasonable salary. And both John, my business partner, and I have a fair and reasonable salary that we pay ourselves from our business. At the end of it, we can decide whether we're going to use whatever's left over um, to hire a, a new employee or to scale or to, to have another outsourcing partner. Um, whether we're going to take that in the form of profits uh, or whether we're going to buy a new piece of equipment or computer for our business. So I think that's really where the, that, that comes into play is paying yourself first is making sure you've set yourself a fair and reasonable salary because you can't continue to do this unless you're deriving revenue. And so again, once those bills are paid that are necessary, you know, figuring out what's left over and then determining from there what you're going to do with that, you gotta you got to have a living. you got a roof over your head, food, so you got to make sure you're paying yourself first when it comes to uh, to, to a, a business. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so many people pay themselves last or mm -hmm. they don't pay themselves at all, which is not really sustainable for, for a long time, right? I, I, I personally believe that there are periods when you really have to hustle a little bit more to maybe set up a new project or to, you know, go into a new market or whatever you want to accomplish. But, uh, like, long term you should have a business that supports your lifestyle that supports your level of happiness and 
contentment and you know the the impact you want to make in the world um, instead of just working or creating a job for yourself uh, absolutely yes the whole point of being an entrepreneur in my opinion is to have that freedom and flexibility um, and part of that is both comes with pros and cons some of those cons are as you mentioned we hustle we do what we have to do to get the job done but yeah this isn't a business unless you're able to live um, on what you're making and that doesn't mean at the beginning I wasn't working three jobs to do what I was doing right I didn't make enough to live off of at the beginning I worked three jobs I valet cars I worked for a reservation company um, you know I sold uh, some some health insurance and some some ancillary types of things but I did what I had to do and as the income began to rise I kept falling off those additional jobs making sure I was able to sustain my lifestyle and wasn't able to really grow um, and expand until, and then this was also in the early 2000s when a lot of this technology wasn't present where it is today. So I'd say that that was also a big part of it is technology has helped us close the gap and again, make some of these things that we need more affordable um, than in the past where you really had to hire human capital for a lot of these types of tasks. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, just coming back to your example of, you know, booking appointments, now you can have a Calendly, it's, I think that's like 80 bucks a year or something. <laughs> well, <laughs> or, just the numbers, Christine. Yeah. I mean, I was paying, we were paying, um, you know, an office administrator, I don't know, maybe $50,000 a year, you know, $35,000 maybe in salary, plus all of the benefits that go into it, the taxes that are paid at the end of it, it's about 50,000. So we, we looked at it again when we were able to hit this reset button and said, what can we do with $50,000? Well, we could hire a lot of, um, outsourced partners with that same dollar amount, yet those people are experts in those areas. And so, you know, a great, great example. We didn't have this opportunity in 2000, but now in, in the year that we're in, 20, approaching 2020, uh, there's so many great technologies out there that are saving us a ton of money, yet providing us exactly what we need. Yeah, yeah. And thank God there is technology <laughs> oh, yes. and it's evolving and making the entrepreneur's life much easier. Yes. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, it's really brilliant, you know, instead of having somebody to set your appointments, especially, you know, with all the different time zones, if you work international mm. <laughs> and before I had my calendar, you know, oftentimes, especially, you know, one country is going to winter time, the other one isn't. And, you know, everything gets like mixed up. Um, oh. It's, it's not a good feeling. <laughs> no, not at all. Yes. You never know what time zone you're in or where you're at. And I, I get all of those problems are eliminated now. Yeah. Yeah. You don't yeah. need to figure it out. You just need to send your link for like 80 to 100 bucks a year. I think that's pretty brilliant. Yeah. And you never miss a meeting. Yeah. Plus you can send reminders and you don't, you don't even need a human, which would probably be much more if you just look at the plane cost. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. So what is kind of maybe the parting advice you would love to leave us with? Yeah. So really two things is, you know, especially for all the listeners out there, the first is um, really kind of thinking through the process of instead of hiring within first looking to see what can be outsourced, what can be, um, you know, used with some of these partners that, that we've, that we've hooked up with. Um, and so again, it's building your business smarter. Uh, what are the best ways to do that? That's some of the things that we love to think about. And the second is once you've had and created that business, making sure that you are managing the financial side of it in the most efficient manner possible. And again, that's either through using uh, savings accounts and budgeting, organizing cash flow. Uh, there's actually a lot of resources out there for you to be able to use um, to make sure your business is running um, in the most efficient manner possible. So those are the two, two areas that I think we're most passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so important, especially the finance part, you can focus on growing your business, but you also have to focus on what, what piece do you get to keep is yeah. even more important because, you know, you can hit those big numbers. And I talk to entrepreneurs oftentimes who have managed to level up yet another level and, you know, they're making their seven figures or even beyond, but then at the end of the day, there's even less in their pockets. Yeah, or they're working 80 hours a week to do that. And if they have yeah. a family or if their passions are someplace else, you're, that's only sustainable for so long. And so, again, what I think is by using some of these tools, it lengthens that runway that you have so that you don't get burnt out in your business. I mean, your business needs you to survive. And if you are not in the most healthy either mindsets or, or physical health, um, it's going to suffer. And so these are some of the areas that you can use 
to make sure that you are enjoying and loving what you do and not have to do those tasks that you absolutely either can't stand or are just not good at. Um, there's, yeah. there's other ways to do those. Yeah, it's not just kind of wasted time, but it's also wasted energy and wasted mm. joy that you don't experience by doing something you can't stand, <laughs> but yes. you need to do for your business, right? So for me, it's definitely like all the bookkeeping stuff. Like, oh, mm. no, <laughs> I definitely have somebody doing it because all the, you know, the worries, I want to pull my head out, hair out moments. <laughs> they are just not good. And you show up in a different way in the world if you worry about stuff like this. So you brought us a wonderful uh, resource and in, in, interview questions to ask the right questions when hiring financial planner. And you also have somebody available like a part-time CFO. Yes, fractional <laughs> so, CFO. Yes. Fractional CFO. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So, you know, really two things is if we're going to continue talking about scaling and outsourcing, one of the areas is, is helping to outsource your finances. So having someone that holds that you're holding accountable to make sure that the finances of the business are moving in the direction that it needs to. Um, I, I feel like it's just one of those costs that you need to, to, to board at some point. Um, and so if you're going to hire a financial advisor on our website, candorpath.com forward slash interview, there's some really great questions. It's a PDF document to build out what questions should you be asking a financial advisor that you're interviewing to make sure you hit on really kind of the, the areas that, that are important. And the second is if you're in that small to medium sized business, you're starting to have some questions about financial statements or auditing or looking maybe to sell um, and, and do something else. Uh, really having that CFO on, on hand is important, but not all of us can afford to have a, a chief financial officer uh, in house. And so what we've decided to do to give back to this whole movement is that we have a, uh, a CFO who is on staff at our firm. And his job is to be a fractional CFO, to come into your business um, on an hourly basis, figure out where are the areas that you are struggling with, serve as that CFO, and then once you're done or once the problem has been solved, or maybe you get to a point where you want to bring someone in full time, you now have everything in an organized manner. And so those are the, really the two ways that we love helping other entrepreneurs out. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing your wisdom. Do you have a quote you want to leave us with? Oh my goodness, Christine. First of all, thank you very much for having me on here. Um, I, <laughs> I, I can't think of a quote off the top of my head, um, but all I do know is that, uh, you know, making sure that you do what you love to do um, and whatever that happens to be, uh, just make sure your passion, follow your heart, and um, I think uh, you'll be successful. Yeah, I love that. Follow your heart. Definitely simple. Happy people make people happy. So just make sure you are happy yourself. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing these insights. Uh, they're so crucial to entrepreneurship to really understand the financial pieces and how to handle them and how to make sure you, you get more joy out of the day, out what you're doing, uh, how you can outsource in a way that feels yeah, much lighter. You don't need to hire a $50,000 person a year. There's so many other ways where people really enjoy what you don't like doing. And uh, so take advantage of that and really focus on what you are brilliant at. So your day has then many more hours in the day because it just feels different. So thank you so much, Matt, for having been here. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Well, I hope that this episode was helpful for you, Gorgeous, that you are really taking some of the things we talked about and put it into action. Hop on over to christineschlonsky.com and find the podcast tab, find the episode number 193. And there you have the wonderful resource that Matt is providing the important and difficult questions to ask your advisor so that you are set up to really have an advisor who can support you in the best way and you know exactly what is going on. Obviously, all the links to Matt are right on this page, as well as the show notes and the transcript. And if you are over there at christineschlonsky.com and you found the podcast tab as well, make sure you sign up for the empowerment notes. This is empowerment right into your inbox where I share all the updates about Heart Sales Podcast, as well as things that I usually do not share on social media, but I do share with my tribe. So thank you so much for being 
being here. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in this beautiful world. And I'm saying bye for now. Thank you.